Welcome, everyone, to Bowers House Podcast, episode 16. And for today's guest, we have a 2D animator who is best known for her work on the game Cuphead. She's also worked on Netflix's Green Eggs and Ham and Space Jam 2. She's currently working on a short film called uh, Serenka, Legend of the Warsaw Mermaid. Please give it up for Tina Navrotsky. Tina, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for the intro. Absolutely. And uh, I just wanted to congratulate you right off the bat for Serenka and reaching $41,000 and almost 600 backers. I mean, how does that feel to have a passion project 10 plus years in the making to be fully backed and supported? Oh, it was wonderful. It was it was a lot of hard work. You know, um, crowdfunding is very fickle. You have this like tiny, you know, chance of get striking it lucky and getting it fully funded very quickly. You know, even if you have some followers on on social media and you have some clout, it's still a lot of work. You have to kind of post every day. You have to beg people for money. Um, you you kind of rope in friends and family. <laughs> you do everything you can to meet your goal. And when you get it, um, it's all a lot of work afterwards. You know, I always tell people try and get as many digital rewards as you can because shipping out physical rewards is a is a huge task. Uh, but I'm super grateful. And this was, um, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to make a film. So this was step one in, in getting people paid because I believe artists need to get paid. I don't want people to work for free. And now we're still applying for, you know, grants. Canada is wonderful. I live in, in Ontario. So there are some art grants that we're trying to apply for just to get a bit more funding because it would be nice to be able to pay myself as well. So fingers crossed for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where are you currently at in the production process for Serenka? Uh, so I would say that we're fully wrapped up on pre-production and are in production currently. So all the boards are done, animatics done, all the voice actors were recorded uh, last summer, which was absolutely a delight. Uh, they were wonderful to work with. So now we're fully into animation. The layouts are, are being drawn, the layouts are being painted. So we're kind of doing that in tandem. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is absolutely wonderful. There's some VFX happening. We have a wonderful uh, VFX artist in Ukraine called Sonia Frisova, and she's doing some effects animation for us. So, you know, fully full steam ahead. We're, we're getting there. So that's great. That's awesome. Um, could you give everyone just a, a quick background on the uh, plot of Serenka? Sure. So this is um, a story that's near and dear to my heart. I live in Canada, as I said. I live in Ottawa, but I'm a Polish immigrant. I was born in Radom, Poland, and immigrated because of communism, which was not a delight. So um, I still have a huge you know, amount of family in Poland. Uh, my father lives there, so I try and go back as often as I possibly can. I read, speak the language, and I was raised on you know, Polish stories, Polish legends. And so uh, the legend of the Warsaw Mermaid was actually told to me either by an aunt or by my mother. I'm not quite sure. I was pretty young. And it's different than, I guess, the official version, which is funny because I tried to find that version online and it just doesn't exist. So I guess it's an oral retelling of the story, which was a little bit more interesting than the original version, which is very like uh, maiden in distress, gets captured, gets saved, yay. <laughs> you know, like it's very, very, it's a very easy plot line. And so the one I was told was even more kind of uh, complex. And then because I'm a woman of the 21st century, I wanted to give it a little bit more of a feminist twist because I feel the damsel in distress story has been told before and she is a warrior mermaid. I don't know if you know the logo of Warsaw, which is, you know, she's the emblem of Warsaw. It's a mermaid. She has a sword and a shield. She's badass. And I'm like, why would she need to be saved? Let her save herself. <laughs> so, right. um, so that's kind of like, I don't want to give too much away, but that's a, a little bit of a story. It happens in old Poland. Like the, the timeline is, is very kind of up in the air. It's the telling of the legend of the mermaid coming to, to Warsaw. She protects people with her song. Then she gets betrayed by the fishermen. Uh, in the in the village and um, and she stands up for herself. But there's like, you know, a few other characters in the mix, which is really fun. There's um, uh, in, women could own the property at the time in Poland. So there's a bar matron, a woman who owns a bar, a karczma, and uh, she's a main character in the story as well. So it's kind of an interplay between her and the mermaid. 
uh, and the reality of real women in the real world and the mermaid who represents, I guess, ideals, things to strive for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a new beginning, a new future and so on. So, yeah. That sounds so great. And I'm looking forward to seeing it. And um, I've already been checking out the animations of it on the Indiegogo page and just seeing the way that the hair flows underwater and just like the animations just seem so smooth. And I mean, it, so it's much. coming together great. Yeah. Yeah. And another little sidebar, which is really fun. I, you know, obviously you had a great intro for me. I work in video games most of my life. I have done some TV and film, but video games are kind of my bread and butter. And because of that, um, things are changing now, which is great, but most of my career has been, it spans 18 years now, has been working alongside men. And so for Serenka, because it's a feminist story about a woman's perspective, I'm only working with women. And it's amazing that I found this beautiful team of extremely talented, extremely uh, incredible women from all around the world who are working on the film. So it's, it's a great experience for me. It's a very different experience. That's great, yeah. And it's only going to add to that uniqueness of it. It's already a unique story, but to have people from different backgrounds, it's just going to make it so much better. And, and, you know, and this is like what I really love about the indie space. And I don't know if you, you're aware of it. It's just like, you know, the voices that sometimes get passed over, especially, you know, in video games, it'd be so nice to see more women led games. And I see a lot of, uh, you know, people of color making stories about their own experience. So, uh, giving minorities a voice or giving those people who haven't had the chance to tell their stories uh, the opportunity to tell a story. I think it's great. And that's why I love indie productions. Yay. Yes. Yes. I, I don't know if you were following the Annie Awards. They were, I, I believe they were last night. And uh, I saw there was a huge win for 2D animation. Uh, the, what is it? The Boy and the Heron won, uh, I believe it was Best Character Animation. Yes, and uh, the boy and the heron in general has had a lot of amazing kind of, um, you know, amazing run with all types of awards and nominations. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's absolutely beautiful. And I've been a huge Miyazaki fan since, uh, since I was young. And I've been following all the films. And to me, it's like the pinnacle of Japanese animation is, you know, Studio Ghibli and Hayao Miyazaki. And just seeing the boy and the heron in theaters on the big screen again. I'm so glad the pandemic's over. And um, and yeah, and so so it's just a joy to see it appreciated, not only in Japan, but worldwide. And it is a huge win for 2D animation. And I hope it you know gives people hope that there's still a space for us. I mean, the popularity of Cuphead was also mind blowing how you know people want to see different styles and it doesn't all have to be 3D. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm really rooting for Cuphead to be inducted into the world video game hall of fame because i feel like it it really deserves it it, it was a turning point yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and i mean it's just it, it's a game that just stands on its own with the music the animation everything about it is just so great and um i was wondering since you didn't get to work on calamaria the mermaid boss in the game i was wondering like that would have been the perfect boss for you to animate since you you know you love mermaids yeah she was already done though when i joined the team it was jake uh, clark uh, um uh, who, who did calamari and he did an amazing job with her but my first assignment was another very powerful uh female character which is baroness von bon bon That's and right. it was also like a match made in heaven because i love sweets i love sugar <laughs> like i have a problem slightly i love to bake and so basically said you guys to animate a candy princess i was like yes like this is for me <laughs> you know and i think i i put a lot of you know um myself in her she's very badass um you know and, and slightly bitchy uh which makes it wonderful as a character and she's also iconic and so i think i'm not mad uh that jake got kella and i got you know baroness because it's and now i get to do my own mermaid i get to have all the fun and do a badass mermaid of my own that's true yeah um it's funny because I made a video about Baroness von Bonbon recently uh, about the ties to Marie Antoinette with her. Yes. And when I found out about it, I was like, how did I not pick up on this? It's crazy. The is. sweets. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and the fact that like she throws her head, you know, and all, all these cool references to her. And I was wondering, were there, were there maybe like, other historical figures or other pop culture icons that you wanted to be the influence for the Baroness? 
So I looked at old movie stars as well. And what was really beautiful about Cuphead, and I think, again, like I'm going to keep talking about working for indie studios because when you have people making a game that they just love and care about and want to play, it's a very different atmosphere than, you know, a really big studio who wants to hit like a, um, a profit margin, right? Like there's a, there's a difference motivation. And obviously the teams who make the big games are also passionate and want to make a great product. But there's this, all these layers of bureaucracy that are stopping them doing exactly what they want. And mm-hmm. so with Cuphead, it was this like obsessive passion of trying to make a video game as if it was made in the 1930s. So we tried to put ourselves in the mindset of those animators and really uh, pay homage to them and to their craft. And so for me, there was a lot of influences of like, okay, if I was uh, an animator in the 30s, I'd be looking to like the pop culture stars that are surrounding me at the time. So I also looked at actresses of 1930s, like Bibi Daniels, you know, Betty Grable, and like just try to get their aura, look at videos of them, how did they dress, what was their hair like? So there was always influences from that as well, which is kind of fun. So um, it's also historical figures, but I was trying to pretend they were, you know, my, my you know, inspirations at the time that we were making the game. So it's, it's really delightful. You can, you know, Chad and Jared talk a lot about it. And we all really tried hard to be in that mindset that this is, this is what a video game would have looked like if we had the technology in the 1930s to make a video game. Sure, sure. And I... I could geek out for the rest of this episode on the animations from the game because they're just so awesome and it's just, forget it. I mean, it's, what I wanted to bring up though was the the castle. So Baroness's castle and the animations of it were so cool. So was that a, was that a direct reference to the Fleischer cartoon Swing You Sinners when the barn comes to life? Yes, so that was one of our references. We also, I don't know if you ever played Castle Crashers as well. I've heard of it. Yeah, okay. it, it's a great so game. It's one of my favorite games. And there's this moment where there's this giant cat that chases you and it's a very similar moment where he like, it's monstrous and you have to kind of keep running away and it's like coming towards you. So that was one of my references. I love Castle Crashers. I, I loved it because it was a 2D game and I loved how animated it was, how cartoony it was. You should check it out. It's actually lots of fun to play. Um, and I'm not a great gamer and I can even play it. So it's very kind of casual and, and open to everybody, unlike Cuphead, which I couldn't beat. <laughs> so, you know, I got to the second island and I was proud enough of myself for that. But yes, and also, uh, you know, obviously I was working under a director, Chad Moldenhauer and Jared Moldenhauer, the two brothers behind the game. And they had a very kind of clear vision. They drew me this like delightful thumbnail of what the castle monster looks like when it turns into a monster and it's hilarious. And like he even points to it because it's so gross it's a really terrible drawing and he goes like this is a great drawing (laughs) so um if you look at i have a i think a talk about cuphead that's somewhere on youtube at this point is it the i do show that thumbnail so it's the 2019 digital dragons presentation i believe yes i think so you can check it out on youtube it's been going around it's funny though people still want to hear it like i get invited to festivals and sometimes people ask me to do that same talk and i'm like okay i'll do it again why not cool yeah uh, so have you not beaten that level still to the Sugarland shimmy level? I'm stuck at it. Like that's the level, like it's poetic justice. I think I'm stuck at my own level. That's the one I can't be. I get to the last phase. I get to the monster. I get there and then I die. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I need a really good gamer friend to come over and just like help me beat it because I think right. that's the only way it's going to happen. And I- I've been live streaming it lately and people tell me that the co-op uh, version of the playthrough is actually even more difficult. They, yes. so they the, double the, the HP of the bosses and add more things yeah, and so it's crazy. It <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> even worse. <laughs> it gets easier if you're alone. It's really funny. Yeah, they really didn't. It, it's hilarious because it was like an homage to those retro like games in the, in the 80s where yeah. they were so crazy difficult. But there's like some kind of crazy high you get when you do beat something when it's that difficult. Oh. I think yeah, that's it's the best. Off. It's yeah. so good. Like I, I've died to these bosses so many times, but when you finally do it, and and live stream in front of people, it's even more exciting. You just yeah. fist pump. You're like, yes, finally. You can do it. Yeah. yeah. And have you seen the DLC? Did you try that one? Yes. Oh my gosh, the DLC is great. It is so good. Oh, yeah. 
kitchen in there is, as well is was really delightful and, and beautiful to watch. So I'm so thrilled. That's the one that I got an Annie Award. Speaking of the Annies, um, the whole team got uh, an Annie Award for the animation on DLC. And we all got a little statuette, which is really great. You know, it's on my bookshelf. And so I get to gloat over it for the rest of my life. <laughs> It's well deserved. Yeah, the the animations from the DLC were just so good, and and you got to work on the it was the dog gone yeah, boss dog. on the yes. I, I have a dog. Um, he's right here. I, I I could try and point the camera at him, but I don't know if I'll hit him. But yes, I love dogs, so that was really really nice. Um, I used to, I don't like animating planes, and that was really funny because uh, I took a layout course. I went back to school as a mature student just because I wanted to really focus on two D animation. And um, we had to do layout. And one of our exercises was we had to draw a retro plane over and over and over again. And I picked the Sopwith camel because I thought that was a cute one. And so it was kind of like, again, full circle. Like I've been drawing this kind of plane, you know, a biplane forever. And now I get to draw one in cartoon form, which is nice. So cool. Yeah, you once uh, mentioned how the background of that fight was such a pain point for you that it was the Mr. Chimes of like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it wasn't supposed to be me at the beginning. They were supposed to make it in, um, in three, like, uh, as a stop motion background. And they even had a rig set up for it and everything. So it was supposed to be like on a little kind of carpet, uh, the background goes backwards. Um, and I don't know what the decision was, but like, nope, scrap that. Tina's doing it in 2D. And I hated every moment of it. <laughs> it was so awful. And the thing is, like, that's the, one of those tasks, same as Mr. Chimes, that would have been, like, the easiest thing to do ever in 3D. It would be so easy. It wouldn't take too long. It would be really nice. But in, in 2D, like, calculating the perspective, drawing little grids, and then, like, making sure all the stupid things match up. And there were so many mistakes I did and had to go back and fix. And, yeah, no, it was awful. It was, I think, three weeks of my life was that wow. one background. It was awful. Um, you had also mentioned that perspective has always been a little bit of a pain for you. Has is that something that you've uh, wanted to improve on since then, or that you've you had? I tried. I yeah. keep trying. <laughs> I'm not like I think we all, uh, you know, have our our Achilles heels of things. Generally speaking, it's because you don't practice it a lot. Like at work, there's my dog. There's so there's bad. Appa. Yeah, there's Appa. <laughs> um, so. I think it's because, you know, I'm not a layout artist. I don't draw layout, stay in, day out. Um, and generally speaking, as character, you know, artists, you, you just draw the character and you don't feel like drawing the background. Like you just draw it floating in midair and you're like, there you go. That's a nice character. So yeah. it's something that I've been trying to do. Like um, in the summer, because winter time sucks, I try and go out um, and like sketch streets, like try and, try and get perspective, at least like try and get that going. But, you know, you'd have to really focus on it. And um, maybe I will one day. I have a lot of other stuff I need to focus on. Like one of the reasons I'm doing Serenka is to improve. Because um, this happens to a lot of us. When you get pigeonholed for a style, uh, people think that's the only style you do. And, you know, they just hire you over and over and over again to do it. And so I was lucky with the 1930s style. Everybody really loved it. And so I got to do um, some, like, video clips for rappers. Uh, so Drake had a music video called Knife Talk, and I did a few shots for that. And then, um, like, Drake's protege, Lil Yachty, uh, invited me and Joseph Coleman, who is another uh, animator on Cuphead, to animate, like, a 1930s owl for the beginning of his concert. I think you could find it on YouTube, too. It was really funny. It's like Drake left him a voice message on on his phone. Like, oh, wow. I don't know if he was, like drunk or it was just like really you know but it like it was very heartfelt it was about him like saying how his style is really awesome how he's very proud of him wow. um and so they're like okay and we want this all like frame by frame traditional animated and i think we had like less than three weeks to do over a minute of animation which is insane yeah uh, but me and joseph did it we're like okay and we're like but you cannot be picky and, and we're like and we did so many cheats if you watch it like at one point we make the owl turn around and face the back of the audience so we don't have to do lip sync at one point he like covers his mouth so we don't have to do lip sync at one point like i make him his head turn 360 so for half of it you don't want to see his mouth just like anything to cut on the lip sync because lip sync is very hard to do and this is one of those things because i did video games um i struggle with and so Serenka, there's a few reasons. So one, I want to practice lip sync because I suck at it and I want to get better. 
Two, I want to do slightly more realistic characters, like so human characters, less cartoony. I want to animate emotions because in video games, most of the times you're animating the baddies and so they're angry. <laughs> like that's all they do. They're upset. <laughs> like yeah. there's, not, there's not a lot of subtlety in their emotion. And so uh, Serenka is a huge challenge and hopefully will make me a better animator in the end. And so if you can get hired for the stuff you want to do, just like make your own thing, make your own space and try and try and improve, become a better artist. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like one thing I've always struggled with whenever I've like done drawings is drawing hands. H hands yeah. are like the bane of my existence. I can of never get artist. them to look right. Yeah. We and, actually, uh, uh, we have this really fun thing. I'm working on two video games now, by the way, which is exciting. Hopefully you'll have me back so that I can talk about them when they're out in the open. Absolutely. Out in the wild. Uh, so it's two studios. One is in Montreal, it's called Woodrunner Games, and they're doing a really cool platformer featuring a fat frog, which is delightful. Oh, wow. Um, and then there's another really awesome game, which is extremely ambitious. It's also an indie studio. It's your first game. It's two friends uh, who are Joel and Justin, who are working on a platformer game for the studio Petty Karma. And it is all 2D, beautiful hand-drawn, 2D VFX. The backgrounds are gorgeous. And it's like this super intense fantasy game, um, but like taking inspiration from New Orleans culture because they both grew up in New Orleans. Uh, now I think Justin is in Austin and Joel just moved to New York, but they love New Orleans. And so it has a lot of that kind of like fantasy element, but a lot of like the culture of New Orleans is peppered through it, which is really great. And the protagonist is a woman. So that's really exciting. Um, and it's, it's really cool. It's really epic. It's very like, you know, um western animation meets a little bit of anime it's lots of blood and guts you know very intense and, and then the fat frog so i have like the two really fun games that i'm working on and i'm super excited about them and hopefully you'll have me back when i could like you know share some footage of it and and just the passion behind it again is wonderful everything is gorgeous 2d beautiful frame by frame a lot of different animators have um have really put their heart and soul into it so it's gonna be great that is so exciting. And a hundred percent, if you want to come back and discuss that, I mean, I geek out over video games, so. I'm... Maybe you'll get a chance to play the demo, who knows? Um, so we're hoping for Petty Karma, they're saying they want to have a demo finished, I think by, by summertime. Um, we're, we're, you know, steamrolling ahead. The animation's really, really beautiful. And, and yeah, and so the, and the frog game as well, it's called Croak, I think. Um, it's going to be really exciting to show uh, the different styles that we're working on. And the fact that, you know, 2D is still, uh, um, you know, a, a choice and a very good choice for some types of video games. I think it's wonderful to see. So yeah, exciting. Absolutely. And you mentioned one of them having a, a female protagonist, which is great. And, uh, I have actually a, a story that I wanted to share with you. Um, I had a, a video game developer well known on my podcast named Chris Taylor, and he made a game that I played in the early 2000s called Dungeon Siege. It was this okay. cool RPG. And uh, at that time, I used to go into game stores and see the really cool PC box art, you know, and it, they were like these big uh, boxes. And I remember seeing a female uh on the cover this badass red-headed warrior with a flame sword and i'm like that is so freaking cool he told me the backstory of that was there was a uh a woman on the dev team that said you know what why don't we have a female on the cover she's like all you see in these video games lately are like these big they barbarian buff dudes right yeah, yeah. yeah and she mentioned that and the dev team loved it and they said, we are going to do it. We're going to run with it. And because of what she said, she got a badass woman on the cover. Oh, that's so dis that's just, like, delightful. I love when that happens. And, you know, representation matters. And there's so many female gamers. And, you know, we're stuck playing uh, male characters. This is delightful talk. Uh, so I go to many festivals whenever I can to give talks and to listen to everyone's. There was one which was like, how to not make your... Uh, white straight male protagonist not suck like that was the, <laughs> the, that was the the kind of the talk and they had like white male protagonist bingo and it was hilarious it was like an orphan crew cut or bald lots of guns muscles white you know like, and it's just like <laughs> you're like tragic backstory like you know it's just like 
does not smile <laughs> like all of it was like right there and it was just it's it's true it's like it's you get a bingo very often when you look at that kind of um chart so it like exactly in these spaces where people can go out on a limb and do something slightly different and you know um tell a different story i think that's really really exciting and um, at Petty Karma, I had the opportunity of working with an extremely diverse team. Like, I think that's one of our huge kind of incredible uh, strengths is the diversity on the team. It's, I think, more than 50% uh, women and people who are non-binary. Uh, we have people from all around the world of all different kind of ethnic backgrounds working on the game. And it just shows how creative, how exciting it is, especially for the animators, how you know, there's a there's oh god, I think over like 90 some enemies in this game. And at the beginning, because there were so many, we got to just choose, like, you know, like choose one that you feel you want to do and that's exciting for you. We never thought about which character we want to do because everybody was so different. It was drawn to completely different characters. And then of course the personality we put in them was so diverse and awesome and different. And so, you know, stylistically it all is together, but the personality is coming through the characters, and I think that's really, really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, Tina, because I, I found your mom's blog and she, I got to say, I, I would love to even interview her too, because she is such a badass. And she was talking about how when you and your sister moved to Canada, right? The, for the first two years, your sister couldn't attend school there. So you guys had a neighbor that was teaching her um, I believe it was French. And then you also had someone else that was teaching you guys, uh, or excuse me, it was English. And then someone else who was teaching you both French. And she was mentioning how you guys had all these people from different backgrounds that were helping you out and how important it is to have a circle of people from other countries. And I just thought that that was so awesome of her to mentioned that and i feel like that ties into your team with serenka because not only is it an all-female team but it's people from different cultures different countries and i just think that that's only going to make it even better than it already yeah. is i mean and the thing is those experiences add and this is why i'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of discussing ai but <laughs> um humans have experiences we have cultural backgrounds we have different traumas we have different uh, strengths and different personalities and if you only hire somebody who is like you exactly the same it, it doesn't create different you know perspectives and it doesn't make the story richer and I love that you found my mom's blog, which is really adorable. Um, but I had like, so I grew up in Montreal, Canada, which is a huge immigrant city. And it was ridiculously beautiful. Like my high school, we were, I think in my class, 30 students, 27 different countries. So, and we were all in the French immersion program because immigrants in Quebec have to go to French school. It's a law until we're 16. And so we're in French immersion and we would joke, you know, as teenagers, that if we hold, all hold hands, we're a world peace poster. Uh, and it's very true. And, and what was great about it, about, you know, having all these influences from around the world, different languages, different skin colors, different food, different cultural backgrounds, is that it created an interest. Uh, it created curiosity in young people. Like, you know, we started cultural movie nights. This is like us at 15, 16. We, were, we felt so like artsy and like, oh, you know. So we would ask each person from our class to pick three movies uh, from their country, a comedy, a tragedy, and their favorite film. And then we would host it at different people's houses and everybody would come over. The person who brought the films also had to bring a dish, usually like cooked by their mom, from the country that they come from. And then we would watch these films with subtitles and then discuss them and like, you know, like we would become more cultured. And we went through like India, China, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Japan, um, uh, my friend from Greece, from Korea, Quebec, because we had a Quebecois from Quebec and he was like, and Quebec films are really interesting. So he brought like Quebecois films um, and it was just wonderful. And our, and we would, oh, we would also like make our older siblings buy us alcohol and try and like learn a new cocktail. 
Oh, time. that's great. And like, so we were like 15 year olds getting drunk while watching cultural films. And all our parents who like let us host these events at their houses were like, yep, yeah, absolutely blessing. Go for it. We don't care. This sounds great. <laughs> so, and you know, and that was just like, and Poland is very uh, homogenous. Like there's not a lot of cultural diversity. The bigger cities are getting a little bit more uh, diverse, but not very much. So I feel super blessed and honored that I got to be raised in Canada and especially in a city like Montreal where all my friends are from different backgrounds. And so it really opens your minds to like all the amazing things that are out there in the world, even if you didn't get to travel to these countries by having friends from different backgrounds with different families with different values. It makes you a, a better person, you know, more open minded, uh, more aware that there's not one right way to do things. And I think that's really beautiful. And so I think all teams should have that diversity so that you can experience all these amazing different cultural kind of um, ethnic uh, elements that make up personalities and make you know different people awesome. So, yeah, Because you never know what someone's going to suggest from their culture that will be a unique thing that will be who knows, something really cool that people will appreciate. So I have a really good friend of mine who's from Zimbabwe, uh, but he was raised in South Africa. And recently I saw, I forget if it was Netflix or another studio that is supporting um, uh, a show or a film. I have to find the title because I just briefly saw it pass, but it's based on, you know, African legends. Like, because we've seen so much of like, you know, Greek legends incorporated into our, our kind of uh, now Norse mythology as well as like fairly well known, but there is like such a beautiful, uh, you know, whole plethora of legends and gods and, and amazing characters and heroes that come from, you know, different countries in Africa. And why, why don't we like start exploring those if we want new, exciting stories, right? Right, exactly. Um, I have like a two part question for you. So um if there was like a creature from polish folklore that you feel would have been cool to add to cuphead what do you th like which one do you think uh would have been good and also is there one that kind of scared you as a kid or that you loved well there's a few that are really awesome i think for cuphead Baba Yaga would have been like a really great one. And this is not just Pol in Poland, we have it, but also in a lot of Eastern European countries, we have Baba Yaga. And Baba Yaga is like a witch, but she lives in a house with a, a crow's foot, which is really cool. And so yeah. I think that would have been really fun for Cuphead. I think she, like a really old creepy woman who lives in a house on a crow's foot. I think that would have been great. Uh, but speaking of Polish legends, as I said, uh, Petty Karma's game is inspired by New Orleans, but it's also taking, you know, like characters from cultures from all around the world, including, you know, they love anime, they love Japan, so there's like a few touches of, of things from there. But we have a character called the Rusałka, which is a Polish water demon lady. <laughs> And, That's and, so cool. And I got to animate her when I saw her on the list. I was like, me, 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 <laughs> like, give it to me. And so I got to animate her for that game. So there you go. So we have a badass Polish legend in a video game. It's nice. Fun. That is yeah. so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be so cool to, to see when that comes out. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And um, did your love of theater come from... Um, like reenacting plays with your friends in the first grade? So oh, I, I started really young. I, I really loved, I was like kind of a ham. Like I love making people laugh. I, you know, I was really, uh, I wasn't a shy kid. And my parents signed me up for this tiny little community center theater course. I think I was like seven years old. And they said, well, oh, that's too young. Like, I think like the minimum age was like nine or 10 or something like that. And they're like, you know what? like sign her up if she sucks and can't focus and this is not for her just let us know and we'll like we'll retract her from this class I was in it like I was like I had a monologue <laughs> I was like I was so into this I was like this is me I am the stage the stage is me and then um as a as a I think it was in fifth grade my parents transferred me to a school called FACE in Montreal, and it's legendary it's a public school it's not private but it's called Fine Arts Core Education and this school puts as much emphasis on the arts as it does on like physics and chemistry and all that kind of stuff. So it's mandatory choir singing. It's mandatory instrumental like band music. It's mandatory theater and it's mandatory fine arts. Um, and theater, the theater approach at FACE was delightful. So 
the first year, you know, um, you're, you're like a little bit shy. You don't know, like a lot of people don't know what to do. So we did Commedia dell'arte, but um, it's, a, it's an ancient Italian type of theater, which started with masks. So a lot of old theater, like Korean theater, uh, Greek theater had masks to begin with. And so the Italian ones, and they had certain characters that are stereotypical. So you had Pantalone, he always is represented with a giant nose, he's always old, rich, and he usually has a young daughter or wife, and he's very jealous of her. You have Arlecchino, who is always a servant, he's poor, and very hungry. You have, you know, Columbina, and like you have all these characters, and, and um, they have a certain set of attributes that are very caricatured, and we would play them with no sound, just the mask hiding your face so if you blushed if you like felt really awkward you, nobody can see you and it had to be very big movements and it was all improv with these characters for a year the second year it's improv for an entire year but with no masks and with voices and with different kind of prompts like at one point uh they lined us up from tallest to shortest as you can tell i was like at the very short end of the spectrum and then they they paired the tallest to the shortest like you know together and we're like, okay, the tall person is short and the short person is tall. Create a little sketch where you can show that rather than tell it. Like show that one person is small and one person is tall. And it has to be the opposite of what you are. And then go. And you have like five minutes to figure it out. And then you have to be on stage and do it. And we did that for a whole year. And then the year after that, you start like real theater productions where you get a giant script. You have to audition for the characters. And what's fascinating is they would find scripts with a lot of characters, so a lot of people got to act. But if you really don't like acting at this point, you start working in uh, other production parts of the, so you make the set, you sew the costumes, you do the makeup, you do the sound, you do the light, you like, you do all the production stage work. And then the rest of the kids act. And we do that for the last two years of high school. And it was fucking brilliant. I loved it. I was like, I was of course one of the actors. I usually, I played a lot of male roles because I found the female roles were boring. Um, so I would like audition for the male roles and I was hilarious and I had so much fun. And it was just like, like, and it was a whole year. You had a whole year to create this, this theater production. And um, I did some other classes after I left high school where I would like go back to theater because I loved it so much. But then I discovered animation. At this point, I was just like doing art for like painting and drawing. I didn't do animation. I just did theater and, and drawing. And then one day in college, I discovered that you can meld the two. And now both my passions are like satisfied. That is great. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Talk about a foolproof method that they had uh had there with just like okay if you don't like acting then you'll do the sets and you'll do other things because then uh everyone's interests will be covered there. absolutely and like and they're so proud like the students that would be doing all the background work would like be there for dress rehearsal as our audience like they like the, the crew would be there they could practice the lights the music cues and all that kind of stuff and they were so proud of us and they were so supportive of like the whole production as a whole and you know a lot of people found random interests that later got turned into careers right which is you know like set design and like we had carpenters come in and like build sets with the kids like you know like we, we made like hotels and platforms and like all this other stuff and like people would paint the sets and uh we had um like first costumes at the school which like you can reuse but a lot of times you'd have to sew something specific and you'd have a seamstress come in and, and teach people how to sew um, who are not doing the acting. So you, you learn all these different skills that might turn into a career later down the line. That's awesome. That is so great. And uh, around that time when you were in high school, I, I just feel like your your artistic journey is so cool because it like started when you were eight with drawing and then moving on to when you're 12 you're starting to paint rich people and and their horses and yeah. you're using that to trade so that you can go horseback riding and all this stuff and it's like i it seems like your learning of art was like exponential because then you had your first art exhibit when you were 14 only yeah. i mean that's crazy it was a solo exhibit too i had like 37 paintings i think um yeah, it was it was like a, a mix of a lot of things. I'm a very driven person. <laughs> I think it shows. I like when I like pick a thing, I just go for it. But also, my mom is absolutely 
badass and freaking amazing and you should have her you know like i know she has nothing to do with video games but she's a hilarious person uh she was in the revolution uh so she was in solidarity while pregnant with my sister fighting for freedom uh she was like an art smuggler at one point she's like uh she's one of those people who has insane street smarts and yeah. when we would lie to her as like teenagers she's like no 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 you do it wrong okay <laughs> i think you have to lie better and then she would tell the lie that's more believable and she's like now try and say it again <laughs> You know? wow. and, and then she worked like so many different jobs. So she has a master's in biology. Uh, she came to Canada, was a nanny, obviously, because you couldn't find job in your own trade. She studied photography, was a photographer at one point, did weddings. I remember I was her assistant because you, you it was the film cameras at the time. And the film always runs out on the fucking kiss every time, every time. <laughs> so you always have a second person with a camera just in case it runs out to get like that moment. Yeah. Um, and like, she hated it. She hated weddings so much. And in Polish, she would say, Ile kurwa można mieć zdjęć, which means how many fucking whore pictures can one person want? And I was like, okay. Oh my God. And so she was doing that. And then she like gave that up for obvious reasons. She worked 10 years in home reno shows. So it's like, there was this like big thing in the nineties, early two thousands where everybody did these like makeover shows where you like make over, you know, the house and so on. Um, and so she did like, she knew she's like my height and she like power tools and she would paint walls and do this stuff. She hired me to paint walls for the night crew. Like sometimes you had like the schedule was so tight. You had to work through the night. So as a teenager, I would paint walls under her supervision and make some money that way. And then, and then she became, um, an assistant to a Polish actress for 10 years. Like she would basically do everything. And then in her like fifties, she's like, I write books. I am author now. And now she writes books. <laughs> And like, at, at like, I think um, at 60, she became a gym rat. And she's like, look, I stand on my head. And I'm like, yes, mom, okay. Uh, so yeah, she's writing books now. Um, she's like published quite a few and she's absolutely amazing. She writes novels. She writes a, like kind of more historical based books. Uh, and you got to design the, the cover to like two of them, right? Yes, a bunch of them. I designed the cover. Right, she's like, a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and she's absolutely amazing. And she raised it in this very interesting way to be extremely aggressively independent like uh because she says we can't help you financially ever like that's not going to happen we're immigrants right we have no money and so she, she we had this like giant joke that whenever she we pissed her off as teenagers she was like i cut you out of my will <laughs> <laughs> which has like nothing in it right but like that was the joke um so she she wanted us to be very independent so this is why I took my art super seriously at age eight uh, because I knew we kind of knew from the start that if we wanted to go to college, if we wanted to travel ever, if we wanted anything in life, we cannot depend on our parents. We'll be emotionally supportive, but they can never help us financially. So we have to do it ourselves. So both me and my sister were very uh, early to find jobs, to try and monetize any skills that we had. My sister started babysitting at a very illegal age, but this was like the 90s. So like, like I think 11, she started babysitting other children. Um, and I like, and she worked at bars for years. Uh, she's, a, she's a professor, uh, she teaches history. So we're very different. I draw stuff, she's a smart one. Uh, but like, you know, we were very uh, adamant that we have to be independent. And so that's one of the reasons why I think I took my art so seriously, because I'm like, hey, I love doing this but it's making me enough money to pursue things that, you know, my parents couldn't give me. And one of them was horseback riding, which is not a cheap sport. Um, I really wanted to do it. And my parents are like, well, we can't afford it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to paint horses. And then like this little tiny 12 year old was peddling her art at like stables. I'm like, look, I'll paint your horse. I, I want the money for lessons. And they're like, oh, they felt bad. But like, I got really good at it. And so towards the end, I was like drawing rich people with their horses, you know, like portraits. And then I got to paint the Molson family from the beer, the Molson beer. Oh, wow. Their portrait. And I had exhibitions and I got commissions. And I, I also at 16, so now I had a big portfolio of, of paintings. At 16, I applied to a job for the summer because I was trying to make enough money to go to college. Um, I applied to a job painting sets for movies. It was for The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and I just like showed my portfolio, did not say how old I was. And I was like, I want this job. And they're like, cool. So they hired me and I worked all summer and I did a great job and it was wonderful. The team was great. And at the end, we're like, oh, so like, you know, what university do you go to or whatever? I'm like, I just finished high school. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was, it was a journey, but it was, you know, it was really wonderful 
for my parents to, to give that kind of like, we can't help you, but we're going to make it so you can help yourself forevermore, which created very strong, badass women in both me and my sister. And I think, you know, sometimes uh, hardship creates like very good opportunities and like, you know, makes you into a, a strong individual with like an insane work ethic. <laughs> so A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you say that was the case when after like your eight years of working on casual games when you said like it was when you were getting promoted and you're like wait 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 slow down i don't want to do this interfacing with people and office type stuff i want to be an artist so when you made that decision to pursue 2d art was that going through your head where you're like i'm going at this 100 percent uh, no nerves all in type of mentality? No, it's always terrifying. And I think that's what's interesting about making hard decisions is like, you don't have to not be scared. Like you can be completely terrified. And to me, it was like this really interesting, I don't know if you've ever heard the documentary of the hero's journey. It's like the guy who invented it versus awesome documentary on YouTube. Mm. Um, and when I listened to that, cause I knew the basis of the hero's journey, you know, the call to action, uh, you go into this, like it's a normal everyday person. You go into this magical world, you like, gain experience you have this crazy trauma then you defeat the evil and then you come back uh, to reality and you're completely changed and you know so it happens over and again lord of the rings harry potter all those things but what was fascinating about watching the documentary is like people love the hero's journey for two reasons one because they've lived it because they heard the call to action they were terrified they did something that was terrifying they got over all these hardships they got this new skill and then they got back to reality and most of us go through the hero's journey several times in their lives, but some people don't. They hear the call and then they ignore it. Mm. And they're scared and they're just gonna stay the course, do the boring thing and never do it. And they love reading and watching the hero's journey because they long to do it, but they're too scared. And I never thought people like that existed. I was like, what? They don't? <laughs> they don't do the thing that's terrifying? How can you not, you know? So to me, um, when you mentioned that moment in life, like I was doing everything right. Like I, I had just bought a condo at 21. I had been working for eight years. I was getting promoted. People were really happy with my work. But as I got promoted, I was doing less and less art and doing more and more Excel sheets and meetings and talking with clients. And it was awful. And I was really, really unhappy. And uh, I like thought, okay, do I like, you know, all the security that I've worked so hard to get, do I dump all that and like, you know, try and refresh my passion for what I really love, which is frame by frame 2D animation? Or do I stay the course and be miserable for the rest of my life? And my mom, in her wisdom, she's like, so do you want to be happy or rich? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> oh, when you say it that way. So like, I basically, you know, I did the terrifying thing. I, I left Montreal. I moved to Toronto to go back to school as a mature student. I was about over a decade older than everybody else in my year. Um, I, I took all my life savings to pay for really high school fees. I was living in a shitty basement apartment that had cockroaches and like, you know, centipedes and things. I was dirt poor again. Uh, but every day of my time at school, I just did paper animation because that's what I really wanted to do. The old school flipping every single exercise that I did at Sheridan College was on paper. And what's hilarious is recently, one of my exercises from like 10 years ago when I was at Sheridan went viral on YouTube, like tons of people got into it. And I'm like, why now? <laughs> like it's just, it's just been sitting on the internet for like, you know, ever like collecting dust. And it was like a lip sync exercise with this like very busty lady that I animated. Um, huh. Yeah, from the birdcage from with uh, Robin Williams. It was like a, a, a line from the birdcage. So weird. Wow. But anyway, I did that. Um, and I did it for two years. The program is four years and it's just really expensive. I know for Americans, this will sound cheap, but for Canadians, it's expensive. It's like 10 grand per year. And so I only had 20,000 saved up. And after two years, I was like, okay, I'm done. Like, I'm going to just like go back to work. And I got Cuphead. So my hero's journey <laughs> was really, really well worth it. Um, and it's terrifying and it's really, and it's hard and you know things go wrong and you suffer through it but a lot of the times it's worth it so yeah absolutely and um the fact that you put your stuff out there on a blog and and we can connect that to 
your exercise going viral on YouTube. It's the internet is so strange like that. Weird. It's so bizarre that you can put something out there, you know, yesterday, five years ago, whenever, and then it, someone will find it, you know? Yeah. And uh, the fact that you put it out there and it was found by Studio MDHR is just, Thanks. it's amazing. Yeah, it's and so, so I never had an online presence before then because I'm a bit old school uh, and kind of like archaic. And while I was in 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 Sheridan, we're like, oh, you should have like a little website. You should put something out there. And I'm like, okay. So I made a little blog on like like Blogspot or something, and I just like posted animations in in while I was doing stuff in Sheridan, little painting exercises and whatever we were doing. And MDHR found that random blog and we're like, wow, you do paper animation, you're Canadian, that's amazing. Would you like to do a test animation for us? And I was like, okay, great. So I did a test and they loved it. And we're like, okay, so we're gonna like ship you a giant scanner and um, yeah, you can get started. And I started working full time on Cuphead. I actually worked part time on it at first because I was working at another studio, like part time as well. So I was doing Hoff and Hoff. But they're like, when is your contract up? I'm like, it's in three months. We're like, okay, as soon as you're done, like, like come on over. And so I went, uh, I went over full time to Cuphead for that. And it was like such a high, like we, you know, it was a indie project. So, uh, you know, we weren't paid super well. Like it was just like the bare minimum because that's what they can afford. But we were all really passionate about it. We like all knew, like there was like magic in the air, you know, like it was like electric. Like we knew we were making something really cool. And I told myself like, even if it like is not successful, at least I'm really proud of it and like really excited about it. And I think that's what matters. And then of course, like the insanity like happened afterwards and we're like, what, like what just happened? And it was a roller coaster ride. And I think I owe a lot of my, um, I know like it's a hard time for a lot of animators now. We, a lot of people lose their jobs, but I have some form of stability because of the fame that was attached to that cuphead wave. And I, rode that fucking wave too i was like as soon as it started picking up i'm like i was part of this i went I said yes to every festival yeah. every like, talk i was like i'm gonna like ride this until it freaking fizzles out i'm just gonna keep on going and because i'm delightful a lot of the festivals that invited me once like invite me again and i managed to carve a little name for myself in a little niche and i'm in this like delightful position at this point where like i sit back and jobs come to me, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and, and I go like, so why should I work for you? <laughs> and I feel like such a queen. I'm like, mm, I don't know. Well, Next. <laughs> <You know? laughs> after all that hard work, it's well deserved. It's it is. It took nine, a long time. <laughs> nine thousand drawings, Tina, for Cuphead. Yes. I mean, yes. come on, that's crazy. I, and then also, uh, could you confirm if it was true about? that polygon interview with cuphead how they asked oh did the did the team like suffer through like the process and then it was like the opposite you guys are like we loved it we were so weird like like people asked like oh did they complain that you have to do all of this and i'm like no like a lot of us never had the chance to commercially work on paper and do traditional animation and that was like my dream for like a decade before and yeah. so we were all on a high. Like the only time I suffered was through Mr. Chimes. Like Mr. Chimes was the lowest <laughs> low of that that entire year, like the years that I worked on Cuphead. Everything yeah. else I love. Like every other character I love, Mr. Chimes is going to be the bane of my existence forever. And However, I bought his little Funko Pop. I might burn it one day, but I do own it. <laughs> <laughs> like I have his Funko Pop. That's so funny. Like, but even the players suffered with Mr. Chimes too. Like, I was streaming it the other day, that exact moment where you fight him. And the worst part of it is I'm juggling TikTok chat, Twitch <laughs> chat, playing the having to face him and also doing a matching game in the back. I'm like, what else are they gonna throw in here? A Rubik's Cube to solve? Like, it's crazy. Oh, he's such a hateful character, but the death is my favorite. Like, I actually really enjoyed animating his death. That was the only yeah. the only animation. And it's really sad because like a few characters got like canceled. Um, one of them, I think, like slipped into the internet slyly <laughs> uh, that I animated and never made it to the original game. But another uh -huh. one, which was really exciting, was that there was this like beautiful animation done by Jake Clark of a, a devil and an angel, and it was for or for a section of original Cuphead that got cut, but they reused it in DLC for that like dream sequence. That's right. Um, 
And so it, it made it, which was really cool. I was like, yes, because I really loved those animations. And that was just sitting on a shelf uh, for a really long time. So, But I think only one character that I did got cut, really. Like one entire character. Everything else was like mostly used. So that's really great. Uh, weren't there uh, a couple characters that you had designed for Perilous Peers uh, that didn't make the cut, I think? Well, we do a huge concept phase. And like, I love the art of book. I have it on my shelf here. Hold on. I don't know if you can see it. Uh. Is it? No, it's not going to show. Um, it's like, you know, the, the one with the gold. It's really cool. I'm going to bring it out. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, and it's like, what I love about it, and hopefully your audience will go out and, like, will buy this book. So I have, the like, the limited edition with the gold on it. Wow. Which is really cool. And so in the art of book, you have, like, this huge book, and it has, it shows so much of the concepting, right? Like, you know, how much, how much different characters you create before you get the final character. And so um, we would do just passes. We knew like none of these characters are gonna make it. It's part of the like the creative, like I guess brainstorming moment of it. So there's like tons of characters that I drew that I really loved and I was hoping would make it, but didn't. So, you know, it's just like, you just like put out as much as you can until Chad and Jared uh, have a clear idea of what they want and then we move forward. I have to buy that book. I love these like artwork books from games. I have one for Warcraft because like I grew up on that game and I love the art from it. And it's this thick book that shows like everything printed beautifully on there. But that looks amazing. I have to get that. But sure. I don't know if we can get this like golden intense one because it also like comes with like a little like a an extra like a cell or something. I don't know if I can huh. take it out. It like it's a collector's edition like little thing here and then you oh, have wow. inside a, a cell that is so awesome wow yeah. that looks so cool that's yeah, the so title it, screen it was like a really like maybe on ebay i don't know if you can like buy it new anymore but you can just get the art of book for sure i know that one's available um you can find it and you know to the audience who are listening please go out and buy the art of cuphead because you can see a lot of like those drawings that got cut this is like lovely spread of my uh concepts and it's just like a little grid of like all the little characters <laughs> that didn't make it just like hundreds of them you know like that that were there um and like that's as far as they got to the concept phase and, and that was their death <laughs> you know yeah uh i have to also mention from that same run and gun perilous peers my favorite animation is the lobster hands down what just the backstroking and the water splashing it's just i, I was telling um my in-laws about it even this morning just telling them how it's funny when they come into my stream, sometimes they're like, we can't watch it because it makes us dizzy, but not Cuphead like other games. But I was yeah. telling them, you have to check out Cuphead because it is a work of art and you'll it's really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. I think that's one of those games that was like such a hit on like streaming platforms on Twitch and so on, because a lot of the times people don't want to play it. They just want to watch the pretty things. <laughs> you know? they yes. just enjoy the animation. Like sometimes I would like zone out especially in Perilous Piers, and just watch Caitlin's backgrounds because there's little like Easter eggs on all the signs in the back. And it's just like, oh, you just like watch it and you enjoy it. So. Oh, Tina, I have to ask too. Do you know of any like secret Easter eggs that maybe haven't been mentioned or, or like that you'd be willing to share from the game? Honestly, I think most of them have been discovered. Like fans are yeah. really, really intense. Like mm -hmm. obviously what was really lovely is um, I have an animation drawing here from one of my professors, Nancy Beeman, uh, who worked like in the old Disney days. She worked on uh, Hercules and that was from uh, Fantasia 2000. Um, and she got a lot of the like old, um, like nods to the the generation of animators that like were were you know were part of the 1930s so like grim matchstick is for grim natwick right like and so there's like all these like little like not only there's like there's video game nods uh which is a lot of nerdy video game nods which people get but yeah. there's also a lot of animation history um easter eggs in there and i think it was really nice for like all these different generations of people to like get those little references because uh, you know, not everybody's going to pick up on everything, but if there was a lot of those and they were like very like consciously crafted, <laughs> you know, like yeah. we tried really hard to make sure they're in there. And if you look at the um, Perilous Piers, there's like quite a few uh, in, in like the background, like nods to the 1930s uh, greats. There's like a boat 
uh, named after one of the first female animators uh, in the Fleischer Studios. Uh, so there's like there's a lot of really lovely things like that, and I can't remember all of them because there's too many. But I think the internet found everything. I think like you know I think the community was on it, and I don't think like the uh, the even the um, uh, Marie Antoinette reference I thought was pretty obscure because at the yeah. very beginning she cuts her own head and then like she throws it at the end. I didn't think anybody would get it, and some people did. I was like, wow. Like you did it, you know. Yeah. So, so I was proud. I was. I'm proud of the internet. I think everybody made it made it happen. Yeah, th those are my favorite videos to make. Is like um, bringing light to a reference. Uh, so, uh, with what you just said, you already gave me like three ideas for videos to just cover like some of these old school animation references as well so yeah and like there's not only so there's like video game references so like for example in dlc my character of the bulldog was a reference to a street fighter character um you know there's like like that kind of nerdy stuff then there's like historical references but then on top of it some people even catch on animation references so uh you know we were watching hundreds of um of old cartoons for cuphead and like the flower in, you know, uh, Cagney Carnation, that is a move from like, you know, a very specific Betty Boop episode. And this is like wizard guy who does the same thing. And people yeah. caught on to some of them. And I think some of those might still be yet uncovered, like not uncovered, where like it's a very obscure reference to a very obscure, you know, uh, episode of some like, I don't know, Flip the Frog or whatever. So some of those I think still haven't been uh, taken on. However, like for example, uh, Mac the Apple for the, the the Mac trailer, I animated him, and that's a reference to like Bimbo and and uh, um, any rags, uh, and you know somebody got that, you know, so that oh, was wow. really nice. Yeah, but like you know, it's it's hard because like I even forget some of them, <laughs> but there was yeah. a lot, and some people clued in. So I guess it's the animation nerds that still can do some digging and find you know those little references to like Cuphead characters doing nods to the old school episodes. So yeah. So cool. Um, Tina, lastly, I found this blog post um, that you had uh, put up about Road to El Dorado, which is like one of my wife's like favorite animations. And you were talking about the expressions. Yes. And did that help any of your like animation skills with Cuphead at all with some of like the boss expressions or anything I like that? I think for Cuphead, we were really, again, trying to stick to a certain era. Mm -hmm. um, Road to El Dorado is like brilliant on so many levels as an animation um, reference. First of all, uh, both Tulio and Miguel are like textbook silhouette characters. Like if you watch for animations, they're extremely well silhouetted in almost every single pose. The comedy, the comedic timing is like through the charts. Like it's just so beautiful. The yeah. expressions are delightful. So like just as an animator studying Road to El Dorado will help you in so many ways. But specifically for the expressions of Cuphead, we again wanted to like dig deep because there's this like especially like teenagers who want to draw like, you know, the 30s style, they'll draw like the pie, like, you know, the white face of Mickey Mouse type thing, put a pie eye on it and like a little black body and you're like, yay, I drew a 30s character. And it's like, well, so like the ambition we had was that we wanted to really pay homage to those artists and the creativity that was around. So we didn't want two faces of two characters in Cuphead to be the same. So you never have like a copy paste of the same face with like a different body. It's always original. And mm -hmm. we wanted the expressions to be as fucking weird as possible to yeah. give homage to the weird like expressions that the thirties did. So, you know, it's not the Disney style. It's very much that old school style. And like, I would frame by frame, like especially Popeye is like genius for like a lot of you, like olive oil, Popeye, Brutus, like they all like have these like insane expressions and like, and like um, even like Grampy from Betty Boop has some weird ass expressions. So like yeah. going frame by frame on YouTube and picking up on like, what are they doing with these faces was again, part of that insane amount of research that went into like making sure we reflect that. And I think that's why people watch Cuphead and really feel that style because we were so obsessive. <laughs> I think I think the obsession yeah. is real. Yeah, that, 
it was just that passion that all you guys had, that small team passion that you had mentioned. That is what creates phenomenal video games. And uh, when you compare it to the big corporations that have like these insanely large teams and everything, it's and just... Budgets, and I, I get yeah. it. And, and it is beautiful. And some of them are really wonderful. But I feel like the, the indie space is what has my heart uh, because there is not that level of bureaucracy stopping the creativity. The creativity gets to flow. You get to explore themes that are not like you know, that like the guy on top has a graph and like, oh, that won't sell, you know, like, cause like Cuphead on paper would have not been accepted in any big studio because we're like, oh, it's never been done. It's not going to sell. Why are you doing it on paper? It's so, it's not cost effective. You know, there's like so many things. And then it was this huge success. And if, and if they hadn't done that, then you wouldn't have had all those other games inspired by the 30 style and like platformers wouldn't have had a resurgence and all this other amazing domino effect. And so it's like, it's kind of like, the freedom like of, of children to not have somebody telling them what to do. And I think the indie space has that. And so please keep your eye out, like, you know, follow me on all the things, but keep your eye out uh, for the Petty Karma game and for uh, the Woodrunner game from Montreal, which I think both are completely different games and super cool, super original, super fun. And, um, and again, kind of pushing boundaries, doing something that they just want to, they want to make games they love. And yeah. I think that will resonate with audiences. Like, I just want to make this game that I love and I love playing and I want to play this. And this is why I'm making it. So cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to those games. And I'm glad that you were able to talk about them a little bit and, and describe what they're all about. That's that's so great. And Hopefully uh, I'll be able to like talk a lot more about them soon and share sure. some animations. I'm actually hoping to make a talk uh, about of a process uh, for one of those games and and share it at festivals and hopefully you know if, if there's a festival near you where I am you know come and see me but yeah it's gonna be great and um, I'll be all over it I'll be you know advertising the hell out of them when uh, I have liberty to do so so yeah awesome sounds great well Tina this was so great thank you so so much for doing this interview and do you have anything to plug or promote well, please follow me on all the things. Obviously, I have Instagram, I have Twitter, which I'm going to keep on dead naming because I don't want to call it the other thing. Um, <laughs> I, I have my blog, but more importantly, you can uh, find Serenka on serenkafilm.com. Uh, there is still, we had an Indiegogo campaign, as I mentioned. If you do want to support the film, you can still donate to it even after it's closed. So you can keep us going and keep us uh, you know, pushing the animation forward. And yeah, if you follow me on social media, I will post about festivals that I'm going to. I will post about my film and all the other good things that I'm working on. So follow me. Sounds great. And uh, thank you, everyone, whether you're watching this or listening to it. And uh, we will see you in the next one. Bye. Take care now.